Library Program. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Randall Bennett. I'm the Assistant Director here. Uh, I did want to point out tonight, before we, we talk about anything else, the Society's uh, calendar of events is posted on our website as well as in the handout that's out in the hallway. List the next uh, lecture, the last of this year's uh, season, uh, November 11th on Alder River Grange uh, by Stanley Cow. Stan tells me that that may have to move in to the 18th. So I guess keep your eye on the papers and that the final date, the final decision will be announced in the Citizen and also in the Lewiston paper on that. At the moment, it's scheduled for November 11th here in the uh, lecture hall, and uh, <coughs> it may move to the 18th. Can you tell the reason? Uh, we may have an oral history night uh, focusing on the Vietnam War, which might be interesting. 40th anniversary of the Gulf of Tonga Revolution, so. so uh, uh, well, as you all know, tonight uh, tonight's topic is uh, the town of Andover. <coughs> Andover is celebrating its bicentennial this year, and uh, it's very interesting. We've had two programs. One earlier this year on the town of Gilead, and then this one on uh, the history of Andover. Uh, tonight's speaker is no stranger to the Bethel Historical Society. I know many of you were here last year when uh, Bob Spidell uh, spoke on uh, Pine Ellis, on the Souter Estate in Andover. Uh, and many of you know Bob. Uh, <clears throat> I, I'll just tell you a little bit about his, his background. Uh, Bob Spidell was born and raised in Andover, Maine. Uh, his house was on a hill facing east across the Intervales and Ellis River with a clear view of the Pine Ellis Estate. When he was growing up in Andover in the 1940s, he walked and skied all over the Pine Ellis Estate, familiar with most of the places that I mentioned in the book that he edited and published last year. He graduated from Andover High School in 1951 served in the U.S. Marine Corps from 1953 to 1956. Uh, settling in Southern California in 1958, he graduated from California State University, uh, Long Beach, in 1965. And he's devoted considerable time to uh, California State University at Long Beach. Uh, over the years, he's been awarded the President's Commitment to the University Award in 1994-95. He received the President's Distinguished Service Award in 1997 and was named a Distinguished Alumnus from the College of Liberal Arts in 2003. Uh, he founded his own information service firm, Spidell Publishing, incorporated in 1974 and became the leading publisher of California tax information. Uh, the firm published loose leaf books and newsletters, conducted California and federal tax seminars for tax professionals, and moved into electronic publishing with CD-ROMs and a subscription website. Uh, Spidell Publishing was sold to his employees in 1997, and he retired to San Clemente, California. He worked on the, started work on the Pinellas Journals, which I hope you all have a copy of. Very, very interesting book. In 1999, uh, and a number of us in the research library were also uh, involved in this, uh, photocopying and, and reading some of these great notations by the Souter family of Andover. Um, they kept family journals from 1888 to 1937, and Bob published this last year. And I don't, I don't think anyone else could have uh, done this project, and I certainly know there's no one else that would have done uh, such an excellent job. It's really a, a fund of information on that era, on Andover, and on the area. And uh, so, and again, available in our museum shop makes a great Christmas gift, and that's my own reflection. Uh, Bob is also working on a new book, on a new history of Andover. And uh, he's done a tremendous amount of research and will be sharing quite a bit, a bit of that uh, with us this evening. So without any further ado, would you please welcome with me Bob Spidell. Thanks, Randy. Uh, what I'm going to focus on, uh, Andover uh, celebrated, <coughs> excuse me, bicentennial this year. I'm going to focus mainly on the first hundred years. <laughs> uh, I will get into the 1900s a little bit, but it's going, mainly going to be up to, uh, up, up to including uh, maybe the late 1900s. The, uh, so key Andover dates. First map of Andover was in 1788. 
first white settlers came there, the Ezekiel Merrill family in 1789. The first white child was born there in 1790. The first congregational church was established in 1801. Andover was incorporated in 1804 as East Andover, Massachusetts, because what is now the state of Maine at that point in time was the district of Ma the Eastern District of Massachusetts. Uh, Molly Ockett, an Indian woman who is very famous in this area, and I don't need to tell the Bethlehem Historical Society much about Molly Ockett. Anyway, she died in Andover in 1816, and she's buried there in Woodlawn Cemetery. Uh, Maine attained statehood in 1820, and they changed the name from East Andover, Massachusetts to Andover, Maine. Uh, the present Congregational Church was built in 1831, it's still standing. Along about the, 18, <coughs> excuse me, about the 1850s, logging became more important. In the early years, most of the settlers were subsistence farmers, and any of the exports that they sent out of the valley were usually farm products. A few wood products, but mainly farm products. But in the 1850s and later, logging became more economically important because the dams on the Rangeley Lakes were built in the 1850s, and they were built to drive logs down, down the end of Scoggin River. So logging in and around Andover became more important in the late 1800s. And also, Andover became the gateway to the, to the uh, Rangeley Lakes because it was the easiest way to get there. And in the uh, mid 1800s, uh, of the few, few white people that, that uh, got that far north discovered that there were some very large brook trout, eight, 10, eight and 10 pound brook trout were common, some even 11 and 12 pound. So Andover became a summer resort of sorts. And the first hotel was built in 1858. And by the 1860s, Andover had seven school districts. Uh, no child had to go much more than two miles to get to school. Uh, the Union Hall, later called the Town Hall, was built in 1869. And in the late 1860s, and early 70s, the three covered bridges were built, so transportation was quite becoming more important. Uh, and in the 1890s, family farms went into decline, and pulp was starting to flourish because the paper mills were built in Rockford in the 1890s. Uh, telephones came to Andover in 1889, and electricity came, and the roads started being plowed around 1930. So that's kind of, those are some of the things I'm going to talk about tonight. That's kind of an overview. Here's the first known map of Andover. Uh, made in November 1788. It's unsigned, so we don't know who made it. The first known white people to visit Andover visited Andover in 1787. And they were actually uh, on their way back to Andover, Massachusetts. They had been looking, looking uh, sent out by the, the uh, a group in Andover, Massachusetts to find a place to expand out of Massachusetts. And they had gone as far as Belfast, and they were on the way back to Andover, Massachusetts, passed through Bethel. There was a Colonel York here, and it's not quite clear what he was a Colonel of, or if he was a real Colonel. <laughs> but anyway, he told them, he suggested, look at the Ellis River Valley. So they went to Andover, and they liked what they saw. They went, the, the, uh, they went to what is now Andover, Maine. They liked what they saw, and they went back to Andover, Massachusetts, with some bone reports. And one of the, uh, in 1789, Ezekiel Merrill came here. He actually, he came, he was a Revolutionary War veteran from Newburyport, Massachusetts. During the war, he moved his family to Pelham, New Hampshire. Then after the war, they moved to Freiburg and Bethel. And in May of 1789, they, they moved down, down the Enscoggin River to uh, where, where the Ellis River comes in, or right by Rumpen Point. And, and the Indians, they had seven canoes with uh, local, manned by local Indians. And then they paddled up the Ellis River to a, a place near East Ando where the East Branch of the Ellis River and the West Branch come together. And then from there they walked to uh, walked a couple of miles through the woods. And the year before, Ezekiel and his son had built a log cabin there, so they had a cabin to go to. And then uh, they, they built a house which is very near the <coughs> junction of uh, Route 120 and the South Carolina Road and the East End of the Road. <coughs> it's now owned by the Chandler family, and Will Chandler is a direct descendant of Ezekiel Merrill. So that house has been in that family for actually it was outside the family for couple of decades, but it's uh, been that family for almost 200 years. Uh, so they, they expanded the cabin, they built a small hovel for a cow, they rented the cow, they didn't have any cows, they had, uh, he had, seven, he had six children, and so they rented the cow for milk, and they rented the cow from a farmer in Bethel, and took it to the woods to hand over, and in the fall they brought it back. <laughs>
Uh, first black child born in Andover was Susan Merrill, and she was born in June of 1790, after they'd been there a little over a year. And Mrs. Merrill was assisted in childbirth by the famous medicine, Indian medicine woman, Molly Ockett. And Molly Ockett's name, I spelled Molly Ockett. You can spell it however you want to, <laughs> because however you spell it probably will be correct. Uh, the uh, Beth Historical Society has some of her artifacts, including this birth track, birth spark box. Uh, the, uh, oops, that was the wrong button. The main historical society, I got that photo from the main historical society. This is a, this is a leather box that Molly Opta had. Now these two artifacts are both probably 200 or 200 plus years old. Because she died in 1816. Uh, this is a gravestone in Woodlawn Cemetery in Andover. And the way she got the name Molly Ockett, according to one of the reports I read, is she was baptized into the Christian faith, and they gave her the name Mary Agatha. Well, Indians have troubles with animals and things like that. So when somebody says, what's your name? She say, Molly Agatha. And that was her version of Mary Agatha. And so people started calling her Molly Ockett. Uh, sometimes it's spelled like on the gravestone, Malachit, sometimes Malachit. Anyway, I think Mal knowing the history, I think Malachit is probably the, that's the most common version, even though her, her gravestone doesn't say so. Uh, she died in 1816 in Andover. She died on Andover Common. She, wanted, she was staying with a family in Andover. She died on Andover Common. She didn't want to die inside. So they, they hauled her out on the common and let her die outside. She died there. And this gravestone was not erected until the 1860s. Uh, and right after the Civil War, uh, a ladies' group in Andover decided that she deserved a good gravestone, so they collected some money, raised some money, and that gravestone is uh, date, uh, 1816, it dates to about 1867. The second settler in Andover was a man named Enoch Adams, and he settled in the southern part of the town, not far from the Covered Bridge, a little bit north of the Covered Bridge, right on Route 5. Do you know where the writing rink is, where the Willis River Riders? Okay, mm -hmm. about a, between there and the Bailey Park. And that house is still there. And the Whittons lived there uh, in the 1940s, and I think probably even, even in the 1950s. And while they were, repair, were repairing the roof, they, they had some, the roof had three boards, about four feet wide, cut from some big pine. And up between the, those boards and the rafters, uh, and the boards in the roof, rather, our Quentin Sr. found an old book, which was Enoch Adams' survey notes. He, he surveyed Andover in 1800. Our Quentin Jr. now has it, and he let me borrow it a couple years ago to photocopy some of the pages, but he started surveying Andover from the Roper line and, and surveyed it. So his, his record still, his, uh, his survey record still exists. Another Indian, friend Indian, was a man named Metallic, metallic, take a pick, name spell, have it, does it different ways easily. Anyway, he befriended the Merrills and the other early settlers. He spent a lot of the time around the lakes, around Lake Ombagog, and also in the Narrows area between uh, Upper and Lower Richardson. And he, he used to come to Andover for his supplies and socializing. And he died in Stewartstown, New Hampshire in February 1847, and he's buried there. And on his gravestone it says he's a hundred, he was a hundred and how many years old? 120, 120, 120 years old? Yeah. Well nobody knows when he was born. I mean it's, <laughs> <laughs> you can't prove this, prove that. But does common sense tell you that under the harsh conditions in those days that a man would live to be 120 years old? It doesn't tell me that. Anyway, uh, he died there and he's buried there. Uh, the uh, Beth Historical Society. Now, do you have, actually have his antlers here, Stan? Yes, right they, on the wall. They, they have his antlers, and here's a picture of his antlers. There's a wonderful story in, uh, actually several stories in another book called named Andover Memorials, which you can buy from the Andover <coughs> Educational Fund. In it, the talent and his dog were out hunting one day, and they found a moose that was sleeping. And so the talent was, in a, I guess, in a, had a state of temporary, temporary insanity, or was in an adventurous spirit. He jumped on the moose's back and grabbed him by the horns. Well, you've probably seen road pictures of rodeos. <laughs> well, the moose acted just like a horse. He was grabbed, he had the moose by the horns, and the moose ran through bush and thickets trying to, trying to scrape him off. 
and he finally got to a point where he could pull his knife out and stab the moose. But in the meantime, he suffered some broken ribs and all kinds of bruises and whatever, and he had to go to Andover to get doctored up. <laughs> I don't think he went for a moose ride again. <laughs> Uh, here's a picture of his gravestone. Uh, I actually uh, electronically made this. It's kind of hard to read. I asked electronically to put that stuff on in my uh, Adobe Photoshop program. And it says here, uh, the lone Indian of the Nogalloway died about 1850, last of the Kawash Oaks. That was the name of the tribe that he, that he allegedly belonged to. Uh, and over censuses. Uh, interesting to see how Andover grew. Uh, first, in 1790, there were only, uh, actually that should be 10, I don't know why I changed that to 10, but it didn't come up that way. It should have been 10 people, that would be the Ezekiel Merrill family. Then it grew uh, fairly steadily, uh, really jumped in, in the 1790s, and the first settlers, a large number of the first settlers in Andover that came there in the 1790s were Revolutionary War veterans, and they could get land either free or dirt cheap, and so a lot of them moved there. So that's why it was a, a big jump uh, between 1790 and 1800. Then it grew fairly steadily until 1850, and in 1850 the population was 710. 150 years later, 2000, it's 864. In 150 years, the population grew by 154 people. That holds average about one person per year. <laughs> now there were years that it was uh, a little bit higher, but anyway, that was, that's the latest population. So. So uh, Andover, uh, anybody that doesn't think Andover is a blooming metropolis, all you have to do is look at this. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I, I strongly, Andover seems to be uh, uh, under a uh, boom right now, and I strongly suspect that uh, when the 2010 census comes out, it will be somewhat above that number. The uh, first settlers in Andover were really all subsistence farmers. And what they would do is they would, most of them came from Massachusetts, some came from, uh, uh, places in southern Maine, what they would do is they would go up to Andover and they would cut some, they'd, they'd buy a lot or, or get rice to a lot somehow, they'd cut the trees, cut a bunch of trees, clear the lot, and then they'd go back. And the following year they'd come and they'd burn the trees. They didn't, they didn't use them to build cabin, they, they just burned them, they just made trees. And they did that for a couple of years and, until they, maybe after the, maybe the second year, they would pull out some stumps and then they'd start planting some crops and they'd bring their family up. And Early on, there really was not much commerce with the outside world. It was transportation, it was so far away, and transportation being what it was, there was just not much, much uh, commerce with the outside world. And the main means of, of uh, transportation were oxen. To start with, you read the early reports, and they were all oxen. Horses didn't come in until a little bit later, sometime in the maybe 1830s and so forth. So here's a couple of yoke of oxen. And, uh, Henry Barnum Poor, who was born in Andover, and is, uh, is, I don't know if he's buried in Woodlawn Cemetery or not, but his gravestone is there. Anyway, he, he was uh, born there in uh, 1812, and in 1804 at the centennial, when he was 92 years old, he gave the keynote speech. And in it, he, he had one that had this, I, I'm not going to read that, but I'm going to kind of summarize it, uh, that uh, in uh, Around 1829 or 30, his brother Eldridge Poor and another man named Barnum Abbott took two four ox teams that in the wintertime with sleds. They were loaded with shingles. This is one of the few forest products that was, was not so bulky that, that, that was light enough in weight that they could take it somewhere and make money. They went to Portland, took them, four, uh, took them 16 days. They had to have hay for their horses, and they also, the food they took, they had something called a bean porridge, which I presume was something like a bean soup. What they would do is they cook it, then they then they put it outside to freeze, but they put a rope in it. And then they take it out of the pot after it's frozen, and they tie this bean porridge onto a stake on the sled. And whenever mealtime came, they'd take a knife or an axe and, and knock off a piece and cook it up, and that was their meal. <laughs> and so this this was the this was the types of commerce that they used. And they also took some bread and anyway, that was the way that that the farmers started in Andover with taking uh, uh, ag agricultural goods and uh, also taking a few other, uh, uh, maybe some uh, forest products that had a high value, and they would trade them for things that they didn't have in Andover, like salt, metal, and nails in those days were made by hand. And so they would take <coughs> nails and, uh, and take, get some metal and have a blacksmith make nails by hand. You've probably, some of you have seen these old square nails. 
but they, they made them, those are made by Vikes. And so those are the things that, those are some of the first manufacturing goods are the first things that, that Andover engaged in, uh, in the way of commerce. Uh, they didn't have electricity or refrigerators, things like that, so what they would do is, in the winter, they would cut ice. They would find a pond or even the river. I can remember when I was a kid, I lived near the Ellis River. I can remember in the wintertime, uh, farmers would go there, people would go there, and they'd cut ice. And they had an ice house, which would be a big shed, like a kind of like a garage, a small garage. They would put a lot of sawdust in it. Sawdust was a good insulator. So they'd put a layer of ice, and a layer of sawdust on it, a layer of ice, a layer of sawdust on it. And that's the way they kept their ice up until the middle of the summer. They finally would melt around August or something like that. Here's an old picture uh, that I got from Judy Poor showing them cutting ice in the end. Uh, you probably have all seen stone walls, right? Did you know they also made stump fences? What they would do, they clear the land, cut the trees down, and they would pull the stumps, and they'd use the stumps for a fence. And they'd dig the rocks out so they could plow it and use, use the stones for a fence. Now, stone walls are forever, right? But stumps rock, so you don't see a stump fence. And this is the only picture I've ever seen of a stump fence, and that's a stump fence that was in hand that. That picture was taken around 1900. So those, those stumps are probably pretty old. And I don't recognize the house in the picture. Maybe I would if I uh, took a close look at it. This is Hay in Andover, also around 1900. The man on the ground is Alcott Poor. Uh, he owned the, uh, a farm in Andover, almost across the street from the cemetery on South Main Street, a very large house on the west side of the street uh, called the Homestead. And his ancestors were the first settlers on there, on that house, and his descendants today own it. So that, that was also out of the family for a decade or two in the 1950s and 60s, I think. And so anyway, but, but it's back in the family now. And the man uh, on top of the, on top of the uh, hay there, I believe, is his son Sylvanus Gore, who was born in 1880. I think that's him. Does that look like a 21-year-old? Twenty year old. Yeah, I, that, I know that's all about court because I've seen pictures of him. He had a big beard. Like like the remember Smith Brothers Top Golf, they had a big beard, well, he had a big beard like that. He had two brothers. I, I've seen a picture of all three of the brothers together. They all had beards. They could have been triplets. Here's some farm statistics. These are the earliest uh, statistics I could find, and it's very interesting to look at some of the crops that were grown in Andover that totally surprised me and, and in the quantities in which they were grown. Uh, first of all, horses, uh, they had 271 horses, 173 oxen. So by, by 1860, the horses and oxen were relatively even. Uh, they had 431 head of cattle. They grew about 500 bushels of wheat, 2,000 bushels of rye, 6,000 bushels of oats. They, had, they produced more than 5,000 pounds of wool. They had peas, beans, so forth, about 4,500 bushel almost 10,000 bushel of potatoes, uh, 4,000 bushel of buckwheat, eight tons of butter, uh, almost two tons of cheese, 2,000 tons of hay, uh, honey, 1,100 pounds of honey. How many of those crops do you think are produced in Andover now in commercial quantities? <laughs> None that I know of. Maple sugar. Maple sugar would be the only one. There are a few people uh, Junior Poor and Richard Pelletier uh, and uh, <coughs> Paul Smith that, that uh, made maple, maple, maple sugar, but outside of that, I don't think any of those other uh, crops are produced in commercial quantities. Here's some livestock from uh, 1900. Uh, by that time, the horses had about doubled from 1860. Uh, there was 200, 296 horses and then some colts. Uh, get you up around 240 of them. Uh, they had 257 cows and oxen. I, I had a little trouble with this one. Uh, they say 12 oxen, oxen three years old, 79, two years old, 100, and one year old, 159. And I don't know what the lifespan of an oxen is, but I think it's more than three years. So I'm not sure that yeah, ox oxen have to be four years old or three or four years old before they're steered before that. Or so. Yeah, but, but but oxen they only had twelve. And ox, they, uh, they were real oxen, you see, but they're steers. Well, they, they, the word oxen is a misnomer there. They, oh, okay. It's supposed to be. You have a certain number of age, you see. You have to be three or four years old before you're an ox. Okay, I see. So if you're 
just here before that. Okay. There were 775 sheep. Uh, you can probably count the number of sheep on both hands and then over today. Uh, say the average value. Uh, so you get an idea of uh, what the value of the, some of the farms were and some of the things that some of the animals that they had. I have another chart from 1930. This time they had uh, about 168 horses, uh, 183 cows. Sheep had dropped from 775 down to 37. Uh, so you can see that that farming was on its way out. Farming was definitely on its way out. Uh, this is all cut poor's threshing sh shed. Uh, in that chart I showed you a few minutes ago where they grew oats and buckwheat and rye and things like that. Well, some of the farmers grew so much they had their own threshing shed. Uh, and so this was his threshing shed. Uh, that picture was taken, uh, also taken around 1900. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, none of these threshing sheds are in Andover, and they haven't been there for decades. I, when I was growing up, I don't remember any of them. They'd all been converted, either converted to something else or pulled down. And uh, there's very little grain, if any, grown in Andover today. Logging became uh, important in the starting in the late 1800s, again, because of the dams that were built on the uh, Rangeley Lakes. And they were built, uh, the dam, those dams were built not for water power, for electricity as it is now, but for driving logs. They wanted the, the water to drive the logs down the rivers. And so it also became uh, important in Andover. And what they would do is they would most of the now logging goes on pretty much year round here now, doesn't it? In those days, logging was mainly in the winter. They would, they would have logging camps, and the men would go to the logging camps and stay for weeks or months. And you could have a logging camp just a few miles outside Andover. And people living in Andover would move a few miles and stay there for weeks and months without even going home because there was no, there was no transportation or very little transportation. What they would do is they would cut the logs and they take them either to a lake and pile them on the lake on top of the ice, or they would pile them on the, on, on the bank of the stream. And then in the, in the stream, when the snow melted and the water was high, they'd th either roll the, logs, roll the log into the river, or in the case of pulp, they just throw it into the river. And occasionally there were log jams. <coughs> this is a log jam on the Ellis River. And uh, you can see in that picture, there's I could count nine individuals there. And what they'd have to do is they would have to get to the bottom of that pile and remove the keys, the thing that held it all together. And sometimes they'd use dynamite to blow them up. Sometimes they just have to keep rolling logs off until they finally got there. Very dangerous work. It was cold, dirty, hard, dangerous work. And uh, it was not uncommon for uh, the, the uh, log drivers to fall into the river. And a very, very, very uncommon not to, as a matter of fact. And, uh, a couple of years ago, about three or four years ago, probably five years ago now, Beverly Swan, who's the president of the Andover Historical Society, and I interviewed Alan Frazier, who uh, grew up in Andover, and a lot of you know him, he's very active in the Historical Society here. Uh, we interviewed Alan, and he was talking about driving, he was one of the uh, things he was telling us about was driving logs. And he was also, actually, in those days it was mainly pulp, but the same principle applied. And on the Androscoggin River, between Rumford Center and the falls, they had some booms in the river, going lengthwise of the river. Some of the piers are still there. What they would do is they would cut the pulp, different contractors would cut the pulp upstream, and they would put a brand on, on the end of each stick of pulp. They had a big they had a big hammer. I have one, hammer about 18 inches and on, and it has a head on it about like this, and it has the one I have has a big M on it. Some of them had a C, so they'd smack the end of the pulp with an M, or smack it with a C. When it got, when it got to somewhere behind where Madison's is, right in the river behind Madison's, they sort of uh, just downstream from Rumford Point, from the center rather, they, 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 or they, they had a boom across the river and they would collect all these logs. And from there on down, they had three channels. And an M went in channel one, a C in channel two, and a B in channel three. And they would have people out there sorting these logs all day long in the spring, spring and all summer. They said that. In the spring, it was really cold, and they would uh, they would go to work in the morning. And uh, the foreman was a man from Andover named Bean Belong, and Bean would 
hotel. He said, well, go away. What you ought to do is just jump in right now and get good and wet, and it won't be so bad. <laughs> 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 and then one of them yeah, said, you ought to be ice on the edges of it. <laughs> he wanted to jump in and take a cold early morning bath. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the, the, same, uh, the logs, uh, I think most of them went downstream further. Uh, probably down some of them, I know some of them in the end is probably went down as far as runs with places like that where they were sawed into lumber. And there's all kinds, I have all kinds of pictures of uh, log drives and pulp drives and things like that on the uh, Ellis River. Uh, here's another. This picture was taken about 1875. And this is, uh, this bridge is on North Main Street. It's about 200 yards, 200 yards north of the center of town, if you know where End Over Wood Products is. This is the bridge that you go over about 100 yards before you get to End Over Wood Products. This bridge, I don't remember the exact year it was built, but I know it was built, or it, it was very new at that time, it was built around 1870. And these, these guys are log drivers. I have a, a better version of that, or a, I could make that a little bit better on my computer, and I counted about 40 people there. They're very labor intensive work. And what they're doing is they're driving logs down the river. And just below the end, uh, I mean, just below the, the uh, bridge, right about here, there was a dam across the river. And a uh, man from Andover named Bert Rand had a sawmill there. And the sawmill was powered by water. And underneath the mill, I can remember going there as a kid, underneath the mill was a big water wheel. Now, Water fields are bigger when you're a kid than they are when you're grown up, right? <laughs> Everything's bigger. And then, anyway, I, when I was a kid, I swear it was maybe 12 feet in diameter. I got to thinking about it later, and maybe it's not close to 8 feet in diameter. And what the buddy does, he dam up the water and hold the water overnight, pretty much. Someone gets through it because the dam is not totally waterproof. Someone gets through it, and then when he started in the, in, the, in the morning, he would open the gate, and the water would come down. And this was an undershot wheel, which meant the cups were on the bottom of it, and it would turn this big wheel, which turned the shaft, which had a belt going somewhere, which had a belt going somewhere else, and it finally turned the saw. They, they cut these, uh, these logs into, uh, <coughs> into the boards. And so that was his mill pond right there. Of course, Bert Rand was uh, in the mill in 1875. But they had a better mill there for probably 100 years. That mill has fallen down in the past probably three or four decades, probably in the 1970s or something like that. And eventually it became powered by, I guess, a gasoline or a diesel engine. But it was for, for many, many years it was powered by water power. Um, this is the first hotel that was built in Andover. This is Andover House. And that was right in the center of town, where the Andover Village store is now. And the uh, right here, this is the town hall, right here. The building back is the town hall. This was, a, this was built in 1858 to accommodate the fishermen who were going up to the Richardson Lakes. And uh, it was uh, very popular and it burned in the year 1900. You can see this is a buckboard right here. And uh, what would happen, the way the, the, way the uh, travelers got there is they would generally come by train to Brown's Barn. That's the closest point to Andover from, for the railroad. Then they would take a stage from Brian's Pond to Andover, and then they would stay in the Andover house, and then they would take a buckboard to South Arm the next day. And the guide, they would have a guide, and the guide wouldn't walk in the buck, ride in the buckboard. He would walk through the woods up to South Arm and get there before they did, and then he would row their boat all day or paddle their canoe, whatever they had, and then he'd walk back at night. So he would walk about 18 miles, and had a little rowboat coming the other mile, so he put in a full day. Uh, and so this this was uh, this was the barn. Uh, these are, I believe, these are bicycles. These round things right here. I think those are the big bicycle wheels. Remember the big when the bicycles had a big front wheel. I think those are two bicycles there. And so those buildings are long gone. They were right in the center of town on the uh, on the east side of the street. And the, the, the highway now that goes to South Arm, Rockley Pond, and in East Andover would be. Right here, that road, right here. And the common is, where the common is now is right here. And that house is on the other side of the common, and that house is still standing. How come you can't see the church steeple? <coughs> uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I think probably the church steeple would be 
in back of this, and I think because this is so high, it's taken from ground level, you can't see the church steeple. That would be my guess. You got the, the town hall's right here, so the church steeple would be right in here somewhere. But that, I think that building is just too big. This was the second hotel built in Andover. Uh, this was built by a man named John French. It was later owned by a Dr. Twitchell and then owned by a man named Otis Richardson. And he called it the Blue Lawn. This was uh, on Main Street, uh, just south of the center of Andover. Uh, there's a garage there now, Buster Marston's garage. Uh, it's very close to there, which is now owned by, uh, uh, let's see, Brian Mills owns it now. It was right about where, where that garage is. Uh, across the street here now, the, the, actually there's great houses over here. Across the street now is where the Andover Town Garage is. So that and the, the tennis courts would be right in here somewhere. So this is looking north up Main Street. In, uh, sometime before 1918, that burned in fall of 1918. And that's a color, it's a color postcard. They took a picture and then they hand colored it. <coughs> And uh, these elm trees, when I was a kid, these elm trees, there was a, there was a row of elm trees, beautiful row of elm trees on this side of the street and a row of maple trees on, on the right hand side of the street if you want to handle it. And it was a very beautiful, those are all gone now. This is the homestead where a couple of those other early pictures were taken. That building is still there. Uh, I don't know when that picture was taken, probably in the early 1900s. Uh, that was uh, the first post office in Andover was located in that building. The first library in Andover was located in that building. Uh, it has been a summer resort, uh, hotel, boarding house, etc., etc., off and on. Uh, and uh, right now it's owned by the uh, descendants of the original owners. Uh, George Ellis was married to Sylvia Poor. Sylvia passed away about two years ago, I guess and uh, her children uh, and their spouses and children come there every summer. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think George Ellis is there now. I think I saw him the other day. And so this driveway no longer exists. They uh, uh, that as a driveway now. It's just this grass lawn. This is, the, this is the street. This is the road. The cemetery would be over here somewhere on the other side of this street right about here. This is a woodcut. A uh, man named Farr in the late 1800s published some guides to the, the name of them changed, but it'd be Farr's Guide to the Richardson Lakes, McGalloway, blah, 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 or the Ranger Lakes, and a whole bunch of different things. And he was promoting the area. And this is a woodcut. And what it says, you can't read it very well, it says, a private party en route to Andover, Maine. And uh, this came from uh, his guide in 1877. And these are people who are obviously, here's that belong in a big trunk, a couple of big trunks, and it's a whole family, and they're going. And what they would do is the, the whole family would go to Andover, and the head of the family, the guy with the money, would go fishing <laughs> and leave his wife and kids in, in one of the hotels. And there were all kinds of hiking trails in those hotels, uh, I mean, around and around Andover, and they would go to Andover Falls or Grasshopper Falls or uh, the Devil's Den or any one of the number of places that were seen and they take little side trips while the old man is off fishing, catching these eight, ten, twelve pound trout. <coughs> and the Battle Historical Society, incidentally, has uh, several of those forest guys. I don't know if they have a complete set, but that's where I got that, got that picture. And how did they get there? They didn't have any bridges across the Androscoggin mm -hmm. River. So they had ferries. There, there was a ferry in Bethel. Was the one north of here, up, upstream there? Yeah. I know West Bethel. West Bethel. West Bethel. West Bethel. Yeah. 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 But they wouldn't come from West Bethel in the uh, There was a ferry at Bethel, one at Hanover, one at Rumford Point, and one at Rumford Center at one time. So that was before they had bridges. This one is, says, this, is, this again is a postcard. It says, Ferry on Highway to Andover, Maine. Uh, this, this has, uh, this has been identified as Rumford Point, and I came across the bridge at Rumford Point a couple of days ago, and I looked downstream, and that contour looks very much like those mountains. Uh, but also, if you if you look from uh, at uh, Hanover and also <coughs> the center, the 
mountains and I can't waste the effort, but I believe that's uh, wrote the point, unless someone wants to convince me otherwise. <laughs> so they don't better. Anyway, th those ferries uh, were eventually replaced by bridges. Actually, one bridge took place with a whole bunch of ferries, right? Here's a, and this is what they, this is what they find when they got to Andover. This is a map uh, of Andover, Andover Village, in uh, 1880. This is the Ellis River. This is, this is Route 5, Main Street coming right here. This goes to, this road goes to East Andover. Uh, and then you go up a hill here, and you turn left, and you go to South Arm. You go up a little bit further, you turn left, you go to Washington Pond, and you kind of turn right and keep going on, and you wind up in East Andover. So this is the Ellis River. This would be Sawyer Brook coming in there. And by that time, it had, an, it had a fairly well-developed downtown area. These buildings here are on the west side of the street. Uh, they were uh, identified <coughs> as retail stores, harness shops, dry goods stores, things like that. Andover House stood right here. The Bluemont, it says this is J.A. Frank's, the Bluemont was right here. And this is, uh, this is Cushman's. It was actually Cushman's and Greg's, and they, those families married together, which is right across the street, which is where the Andover Town Garage is now. This map is not entirely accurate because if you were coming from East Andover and you got to the center of town, you'd continue exactly <coughs> straight. It would be pretty much like this. It didn't turn right there, it was exactly straight. And then when you got here to uh, what we call Back Street or Pine Street, there was a slight turn more like this. It did not turn <coughs> anywhere near the north like that. And that's the road to get you to Upton. And uh, the, uh, the covered bridge, the first covered bridge I showed you, Brickett Bridge, is right here. The sawmill was right here. And what is now Andover Wood Products was right about here. The, uh, this is the common. This is the first congregational church. And also uh, the school, Andover uh, Elementary School, was uh, right there. And uh, so anyway, this was the commercial part of the, the center of town. Uh, here's a picture of Andover Village on the west side of it. 1901. Uh, I, will, I have a, another picture taken in 1907, which I'm going to show you. This building, this building is still here. This building is still here. As a, this down here used to be the old post office building, and then down kind of end over on Main Street. And uh, that post office building is now being renovated, and the lady that's doing it is sitting right back here, Susan Barrow. <laughs> uh, Susan, you want to raise your hand? Susan, Susan and her husband. <laughs> Susan and her husband <coughs> bought that building a few months ago, and they're totally renovating it. Uh, and actually, it was two buildings that were kind of welded together, if you will, or melted together, glued together, whatever, nailed together. Uh, the, the northern half of it uh, was probably built in the early 1800s, and the other half of where the old post office used to be was done later. Uh, this, this uh, when I was a kid, this was Ike Mills' store. Uh, it was later Louis Hall store, and then um, Robert Akers owned it, and then two <coughs> million acres. Then it was a Four Seasons Cafe, and now it's the Andover Village Cafe, I believe. Snow that's Valley Diner. Is that right? right Snow there? Valley Diner. Oh, Snow Valley. Yes, that's right. Snow Valley Diner. <laughs> anyway, uh, this was a this was a store. Used to, when I was a kid, Frank McAllister had it. Then uh, Louis Hall. Then uh, Allison Meisner, and it was the telephone office and things like that. And this was, a, when I was a kid, was a, and when this was taken, this was a dry goods store. And when I was a kid, John, John Ellis had a barber shop here. So anyway, that's downtown. And these, these buildings, are, that building is not there, but these other ones are still there. This is that same building, the same building that the one in, oops. This building here is in this next picture. This was taken in 1907. A man named Charlie Dresser owned it at that point in time. And this sign says telephone office. Uh, telephones came to Andover in 1899. Telegraphs, I'm not sure when Andover got its first telegraph, but in these two cases in the back room, take when, when, when I get through here, take a good look in those cases. Peter Stowell, who grew up in Andover, is a good friend of mine. Uh, Peter is a fanatical collector of end, end over mobilia or whatever. <laughs> he's, on the, he's on the internet and eBay and every, all day, every day. He buys books, pictures, 
old newspapers, postcards, anything that has to do with Andover, and he collects them. And I think everything in these two cases, is that right, Stan? Or no, just the one on the, on oh, the window side. Oh, the one on the window side, right. that's all from Peter. Right, this is all ours. Okay, that's it's that, okay. Anyway, as a matter of fact, the Bethel Historical Society has a lot of Andover memorabilia. Anyway, so this is the telephone office at a dry goods store. I'm not sure which one is Charlie Dresser, but I would guess it's him. I doubt it's these two guys. It could be this guy. I, I, I've never seen a picture of it. Anyway, that, that building is still there. And this, this uh, you can't read this, but I uh, pulled around on my computer and I, I could read it. It's, it was where the stage line stopped. One of the stops in the world stage stop. This is the other side of the street. This is where the Andover house was. This fountain used to be in the middle of the street. That's in the middle of the Andover Common now. This picture was taken about the 1920s. Uh, this is uh, now, it used to be Dave's store, Dave Greg owned it, and now it's the Andover, what's the Andover? General store. Andover General store, yeah. And this was owned when I was a kid by Emma Barnes and then Merton Fox was her son. And it was, they, had, they sold ice cream there and books and it's now, it's not a store, I think some people live upstairs. This is, uh, used to be Roger Mills' house. Mills' store is right about here. You can't see it because it's not there in this picture, but that's where it is today, just about there. Andover had a very large fair. Uh, the fairgrounds was almost across the street from the cemetery. It was back this way, about 100 yards from the cemetery and across the street. It was the North, North Oxford County Agricultural Society, or Agricultural Association. And they had big fairs in the fall. This happens to be an ox pull. And here's a couple of oxen here and a whole bunch of spectators standing around. And the fair operated, I, I do not know exactly when it started, sometime in the mid to late 1800s. And uh, it finally closed in the late 1940s uh, because of lack of interest. And I have a couple more pictures. I put this one in here. <laughs> See how people dress up to go to the fair? Mm -hmm. Is that guy dressed or what? I mean, look at that, top hat, a coat, uh, look at the lady with a long skirt. Everybody is dressed up. Now, if you go to a fair today, they're dressed in what? T-shirts, mm -hmm. jeans, shorts, sneakers. <laughs> anyway, this is the dining hall. This is the dining hall here. They, they raise these things and these little uh, things. They make awnings. They had, a, they had a counter right here. Those are, those are the dining halls. They had a racetrack. Okay, this is another picture of Bridget Graves. I showed you a log driving picture that was taken in 1875. This was taken about 1900, 1901, and they had a 4th of July picnic there. And you can see some people in the water here, they're, they're boating. And also, this is how people dressed to go to picnics in those days. <laughs> Not quite as casual as we are today, right? And you can see here, this is the boom, and these are the logs. The sawmill was right down here, and these are the booms that we're holding the logs back to the, the, uh, the logs to be sawed into floors. This is Merrill Bridge. Uh, the uh, picture I showed you of the map of Andover, the 1880 map, where, where the road to East Andover, South Arm, and Roxbury Pond across the river, that's Merrill Bridge. The reason they call it Merrill Bridge is because Ezekiel Maryland and his family owned the house up on the hill just up, just up from that bridge. This picture was taken around 1900. And that's how the bridge looked. That bridge was replaced in, I believe, 1937. And also around the late 1800s, <coughs> early 1900s, this downstream from this bridge, about 100 yards, there was a mill that was operated by water power and they made toothpicks. It was a toothpick mill. And that's been long gone. <coughs> Here's the Lovejoy Bridge. This is the only bridge, only covered bridge remaining in Andover. And uh, that's in South Andover. And this picture was taken around 1935. That was the middle of the Depression, right? And you look at this bridge, and it looks pretty decrepit, doesn't it? Really in disrepair. It's about much better repair now, uh, almost 70 years later, than it was then. And I think that's because they just didn't have any money. But they, and that, <coughs> that bridge is still there. That bridge was also built. I don't remember the exact date, but it was all three of the bridges were built around 1870. The way people got to Andover that didn't have their own transportation came on tunnel stage. 
with the Bryce Long uh, to Rumpel Corner, across the, took, took the ferry across from Rumpel Corner to Rumpel Point, and went up to Andover. And in those days, before the mills were built in the 1890s, the center of activity in Rumford was Rumford Corner. And most of the people who lived in Rumford were farmers. And the farms are located all along the Andoscoggin River Valley and the Ellis River Valley. And so that was the center of center of activity was, was uh, uh, Rumford Corner. And tunnels had a stage, I don't know the exact years, but it was from the late 1800s to the early 1900s. Uh, and they were eventually replaced by cars. This picture was taken, I believe, at the 150th anniversary, and it was uh, 150th anniversary, which would have been in 1929. And this is an old stage. And the tunnel stage, uh, eventually, they would they would go to, uh, come through uh, Rumford Corner and Andover, and then, af then after the Rumford, as we know it today, came into existence in the late 1890s, then they would make, kind of make a triangular circuit down to Rumford Falls, as they called it, and then back to Bryce Hall. And so that was the, that was the main uh, the main modes of transportation. Snow rollers. This is a picture of a snow roller. Before snow plows, what they did in the winter time, they would they have a roller. This is a big cylinder, probably six feet in diameter, and depending on how hilly the terrain was and how, how deep the snow, they'd either either uh, take a four horse hitch or a six horse hitch. This one has six horses. This is one pair, two pair, three pair. And there are two men up on the snow roller. And it was usually in two parts, <coughs> uh, two cylinders, eight feet wide each, and probably six to six feet or so in diameter. And so that's what they do. They tag the snow down so that uh, sleighs and sleds and people could uh, run on it and people could walk on it. And this was. They used snow rollers until about 1928. That's when they bought the first snow plow in Andover. And here's the first snow plow. Uh, this, was a, this was a cleat track made by Cleveland Tractor Company. And what it, what it had was it had a frame. It had a big metal frame like this. And there's a bar across here. What they do is they take that bar off, they drive the tractor into it, and then they bolt the tractor to the frame. That's the way it worked. And there's one person driving the tractor, and another one we call this guy the wingman. And there was some uh, some handles here, like cranks here, and he would hand crank. If, if it was a light snow, they would let the wings down and spread them wide, so they'd plow a wide swath through the snow. Or if it was later in the winter, they would they would lift the wings up about this high, and they clip off the top of the snow banks, so they had some place to put the next snowstorm. And so, and then they tend if it was a narrow road or a driveway, then they pull the wings in. And I have another picture here to show you that snow was deeper in those days. Winters were colder, snow harder, times were tougher. Anyway, this was taken around 1930. A man named Ray Thurston was a road commissioner, and that's Ray Thurston right there. I tend to think both of these pictures were taken about the same time because I think that guy is in both of them. And so you can see this, this is probably, right here is probably four feet from the ground, so you can see they had pretty heavy snowstorms there. Now they do all the following with trucks. Uh, this is an interesting picture. In the 1920s, the town of Rumford started plowing the roads. Andover didn't start plowing until the late 1920s. And there was a man who lived in Andover named Homer Richards, who carried the mail to Andover. Homer was a mechanic. So Homer, now I don't know that this is Homer's, I, I, but he had one something like this. This is, I believe, a Model T. What he would do is he'd put skis on the front and, and bolt them onto the front. And he had, you can see the chains on the rear. What he would do is he'd take the mail from Andover down to the Rumford Town Line. And he had a car there. So he'd transfer the mail from his, from this thing right here to his car, drive to Rumford in his car, pick up the mail, whatever else he was delivering, take that back, take it out of his car, put it in this, and drive on to Andover. And he did that for a few years until Andover started plowing the snow. And these were, this, in the early 1900s, this was a not an uncommon, uh, not an uncommon way to do things. Uh, Larry Parsons, who ran the Lakewood camps up the Middle Dam for many years, he had one, a later model, the same, the same technology, but his had a, his had a cab on it and a door, and uh, depending early in the season and late in the season, he'd drive with the door open in case it went in, he could jump out. <laughs> 
I, I have a picture of that, but I thought this is just a little bit older, so I tossed this one in. I don't know who the woman is in the background there. Uh, seven school districts came overhead in the uh, 1860s. There was the village school, which was on Elm Street, right next to the church. As a matter of fact, the church parking lot is where the school used to be. Uh, they had one in South Andover on Route 5, just south of the Cover Bridge on the west side of the road. That is still there. It's been made into a two-story house. One of the last teachers there was a woman named Dorothy Campbell, Doc Campbell. And she and her husband later bought that house. And Doc died a couple of years ago, and it's now owned by her heir. So she, she, for many years, she lived in the house where she lived near a schoolhouse where she taught school in the 1920s. Uh, one in East Andover, near Slane's Mill. It's now the building where the East Andover Historical Society is. There's one in North Andover, near the corner of North Andover Road and the road that goes to Sawyer North, Sawyer Notch. There's one in Farmers Hill, about 100 yards southwest of the top of the hill on the right. And that building may still be there. Uh, my ancestors lived at the foot of Farmers Hill in the early 1900s. And my aunt, who just passed away a couple of years ago, at the age of 97, went to school there. And a couple of times, I took her up there after asking her where the school was. And we get to the top of Farmers Hill, and if you go straight, if you're familiar with Farmers Hill and East Andover, if you go straight, you go to Horseshoe Pond. If you turn right, you go down to the old cemetery. So we turn right and go about 100 yards. She said, that's it right there. And there's a building there, which could have been, I'm not sure it was, but it's been there a long time. It might, might have been that old schoolhouse in the very <coughs> house. Also, there's Blackberry Academy, which was on Route 20, just west of Blackbrook, uh, as you go to Roxbury Farm. And uh, if you know where Richard Pelletier lives, it would be very close to Richard Pelletier's driveway. <coughs> and that, the, that school, that building also still exists. Eda Perkins, who lives in Andover, uh, the back part of her house was Blackberry Academy. And my mother, when she grew up, she lived next door where Roger Mills lives now. And she remembers around 19, well, she remembered, my mother's no longer with us, but she remembered in the wintertime about 1906 or 7 or 8, when they brought that school building with an ox team on some sleds, brought it from uh, the Rockway Pond Road and nailed it on the back of Edith was now Edith Perkins' house. And so it's the shed on her house. That used to be a schoolhouse. Who says we don't recycle things here? <laughs> and oh, one, there's one on the uh, North Surplus on Surplus Road. This is the road that goes to, actually, that's a misnomer. I got two things mixed up here. Uh, they call it the North Surplus School. It's some of the history, history books, uh, both Peter Stowell, who was very much into Andover history and myself, uh, think that some of the books are wrong. If you go about six miles west of Andover to Adopton, you run into the township of North Surplus. There was a school there. There's a cemetery. It's almost to be put in There was a school there, but that wasn't in Andover. That was in a separate territory. There was also one, as, as near as we can determine, as a matter of fact, it's on that 1880s map, about two miles west of Andover, uh, right near where Stony Brook is. And so they called that the North Surplus School, but it was not North Surplus. And so I think there were, I think there were probably two schools on that road, one about two miles from the center of town, and over one about six miles. But someday we'll probably get that straightened out. Uh, Henry Poor, I'm going to talk about him in a few minutes. Uh, he was born in Andover in the, in the, uh, at the Bison uh, Centennial in 1904. He told about going to school. I'm not going to read that. You can read the whole thing. But what he said was he, he started, and so Andover had schools early on. He was born in 1812, and he, at the age of about three, he was going to school. And he'd go from 8 o'clock in the morning until 5 in the afternoon with an hour for lunch and a recess in the morning and the afternoon. And uh, he said in the wintertime, they, they had a... Uh, they had, a, they had a fire in the corner, the fireplace in one corner, and when the thermostat thermometer outside was at zero, it was hardly above freezing inside. And his punchline is, the course of instruction was of the rudest kind. There was not an idea in the whole bit. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, it didn't hurt him any because he turned out to be quite successful. I'm going to tell you about him a little bit later. But anyway, uh, they learned ABCs and ciphering, which was the term they used for math in those days. So Andover really early on had schools. How many they had, I just have not found those records and nobody else I know has them either. 
This is the first picture we have of the Andover Village School, or the earliest one that I know of. This uh, was taken about 1885. Uh, this uh, this appeared, the reason it's such a poor picture is this was in uh, the Lewiston Sun in the 18, I'm sorry, the 1960s, so now it's now the Sun Journal, ran a series of photographs of old pictures of towns in this area. And this was owned by a woman named Gertie Smith, who was 93 years old at that point in time, in 1863. And she was born in 1870. And it says, Mrs. Gertie Smith, and was oldest resident, 93 years old this Sunday, was 15 years old when this picture was taken of the Elm Street Grammar School. So that would have been taken about 1885. At some point in time, when I went to school there, I, I like, probably it had, it had to happen in the 1890s because they, they added a high school in the 1890s, the first high school graduating class in Andover was 1899. So probably about the mid-1890s, they made that into a two-story building. And then they tore it down in the 1970s. So this is the oldest picture I have of the Andover, uh, uh, Andover Village School. I have pictures of the other ones, but I, uh, all the other schools, but I thought that would be a little bit much to show all those pictures. This is Andover High School. <coughs> Andover, they had it, they conducted the high school in, uh, the, uh, where the uh, Elm Street School was from about the mid-1890s until 1916 when they built this high school. Uh, this is now the Andover Elementary School, and judging by the by the height of those spruce that are there, those spruce trees, and the height they were when I went to school there in the, in the 1940s, that was probably taken in the 1930s in the winter time. Northern Building, uh, 1916. Right up here it says Andover High School. Now it says Andover Elementary School. Town Hall. Town Hall is very close to the center of town. This is a memo that I got from the Andover Historical Society. Uh, the town, town Hall of Andover was built in 1869 and was named the Union Hall. It was built on land given by John Gould and Mrs. Gould. The land was to be um, the property of the town as long as the building was used as a hall. If not, the land would revert back to the Goulds. Mr. and Mrs. Cushman bought the property under those conditions. They bought it for a dollar, but the deed of the land, uh, and deeded the land to the town. So they bought it from the Goulds for a dollar, they deeded it to the town. And I have a copy of the deed. The deed, the, what the deed, the deed says the same thing, but it also gives the meets and bounds of the lot that it was, that it was built on. And this is, a, this is dated in 1868. And here's an old picture of the hall and a, uh, it was originally called the Union Hall, and it was allegedly built with bonus money donated to the town by Union soldiers when they came back from the Civil War. And I have a memo. My mother collected scrapbooks. She had, a, she had several scrapbooks. In fact, like Gertie Smith, the lady that had the old picture, was her aunt, and she had scrapbooks, which my mother inherited some of them. And I don't know who wrote the memo or when. Some signs are undated, but that memo says that the town hall was built by bonus money donated by the Civil War soldiers, and it's also called the Union Hall. And I can assure you, it wasn't because of labor unions <laughs> in Andover in 1869. <laughs> so anyway, so like, I, I have some circumstantial evidence that I don't have the I don't have the proof that I need, but I, I think it was now. This was before the town. There was an L, L built on here, and also the town clock was added in 1909. <coughs> uh, Town Park was paid for by a group called the King's Daughters. They, they, paid, uh, they paid about $600 for the town clock, including the installation in the 1909. And this is the curtain in the town hall. They have a, there's a big open room on the top, on the second floor. These as the dance please use it for dances and uh, all kinds of social events. And it had a stage, and this is a screen for the stage. This was hand painted in 1922, and it's still there, and the colors are still white. Okay, now I'm going to talk about some interesting people who lived in Andover. Tom French was born in Andover. He was the son of John French, who owned the hotel. I showed you the, the color postcard. Okay, Tom French was a self-taught engineer and mechanic 
And he, in the late 1890s, he built a steam-powered automobile. And I'm not sure where he got the idea, but you probably heard of Stanley Steamers. The Stanley brothers were from Kingfield, right? One of the Stanleys taught school in Andover in the 1870s. Whether I'm, I'm not sure what the connection was, but I strongly suspect that there was some intellectual connection between the Stanleys and Tom French. Because he invented his car, he made a grand total of one. He had several patents on it. He had patents on the suspension, patent on the engine. It was powered by steam, and the steam was generated by burning wood, because that's the only thing they had in those days. They had an abundance of it. Uh, he formed a corporation. Uh, this was the, he formed a partnership with a man named Stevens in Rumford. This is J.K. Stevens, it says here. Sporting goods, bicycles, I'm not sure what that says. So he was interested in mechanics also. Anyway, this is taken on Congress Street in Rumford in 18, uh, 18, either 1899 or 1900, and uh, Richard Fraser has, is anybody here, anybody here familiar with Richard Fraser's book? Richard Fraser, yeah. who is a Bethel, was a Bethel boy, right? right. His mother still lives here, right. Norris Fraser lives here still. Anyway, he wrote a book seven years ago called Main Built Automobile, and he did a lot of research and has a wonderful book full of pictures and documents of every automobile that was all the automobiles that were built in Maine. It's, uh, you probably have copies of it to say there, don't you, Stan? Yes. Yeah, anyway, if anybody's interested in those kind of things, it's a wonderful book, and, and this is uh, uh, printed from his book with his permission. Uh, so anyway, Tom French also, uh, he made stationary steam engines, and he made steam engines, he made a steam engine for a number of boats on the Richardson Lakes and the Rangeley Lakes. And the fate of this car, this is the only one he had and in one of the accounts I read, uh, the, the although he had a great product, apparently, it, it performed well. He drove from Andover to Rumford and back and down to Canton and all around, created a lot of excitement. But like most companies, they ran out of capital and failed uh, in like 1900, 1901. This is the only model in the engine term that they built. And that was apparently driven off in the woods and left her off and left away. Another interesting person who lived in Andover was Moses Greenlee. Moses Greenlee lived in Andover for a few years, married one of the poor girls. I don't, by poor, I don't mean <laughs> poor as not having money for it from the poor family, woman named Persis Gore. And uh, he left Andover and went to central Maine, a town called Williamsburg, and he made the first accurate map of the state of Maine in 1816. And he wrote a book in 1816 called Statistics of the District of Maine or something like that. Was, Peter Stowell has a copy in the showcase back here. Anyway, that was in 1816, and he was one of the prime agitators <coughs> for Maine to become a separate state to separate from Massachusetts. And because he wrote in his book, he had, he had a map, and he also wrote in the book a, a, a detailed economic activity from the state of Maine to show that it was, in fact, would be a viable political entity on its own. And he was one of the... One of the considered to be one of the prime movers in, in the main coming state. Then he also made the second accurate map of Maine, I think in 1820, and then the third one in 1829, or something like that. And he died in the 1830s as a fairly old man. This is not his first map. I couldn't get a copy of the first map. I think this is the, either the 1820 or the 1829 map. And Andover's over here somewhere. But anyway, that was, he made, generally considered by everybody that knows, the first accurate map of the state of Maine. Harvey Park. Have you, have you heard about the Parker House in Boston? Mm -hmm. Harvey Parker was born in Temple, Maine. He wasn't born in Andover, but his mother died when he was when he was a boy, and his father married a widow, a uh, World War of 1812 widow named Sophia Vernon of Andover, when they moved to Andover, and he grew up in Andover. And after he grew up, he left Andover and went, went to Boston. He had a friend who had already left Andover. A friend got him a job as a livery man, for a wealthy woman who lived outside Boston. And he would drive her to Boston in her little story with fringe on top or whatever she had. And while she was doing her shopping and socializing, he would hang out in a restaurant, a tavern. And he saved his money, and eventually the tavern was for sale. He bought it for $432. He apparently was very entrepreneurial and was into customer service before the word had been invented. 
he gave good value and uh, was, was, was very, very, very concerned about his customers. Business grew. He made enough money to build a hotel, which he called the Parker House. It was a five-story hotel. Then, he was so successful there, he built a bigger one. And he, he was credited, I, I have a whole bunch of information on him. Uh, he was credited with uh, inventing the Parker House Rolls, Boston Straw, and Boston Cream Pie. I strongly suspect that his chef or chef might have had a hand in some of those things. But anyway, you know, the, the story's well, anyway, uh, Harvey was an Andover boy. Not born there, but grew up there. Henry Barnum IV, I've told you about uh, Henry Barnum IV several times. Henry Barnum IV was born in Andover in the, the place I showed you, the homestead, almost across the road from the cemetery, born in 1812. He went to college, he was the first Andover uh, native to who graduated from college, graduated from Bowdoin in 1835. His brother, a man named John Alfred, who was a few years older, was an attorney in Bangor. So he joined, in those days, there's no such thing as a law school. You, you did an apprenticeship with an attorney, with an, you, you read for an attorney, and became, you know, eventually became the law. Anyway, he joined his brother, and they became railroad attorneys. And around 1850, he bought a weekly journal in New York called the American Railroad Journal. This, this is, and if you can think back, this is when railroads were just starting to bloom in the United States. Most, most of the uh, journals on railroads, including this one, were about the mechanics, the, the, the engineering, the things, uh, laying the tracks and laying the grade and powering the, you know, all, the, all the technical details. And most railroads in those days, they didn't have stocks like they have today. Uh, they, they sold bonds. Most of them would belly up and the bond holders would let it begin. So he turned that around from the mechanical and engineering and technical aspects of railroading into the financial aspect, and he started rating bonds as to their viability and their investment grade. He eventually uh, turned the business over to his son, and in 19, around 1940, Coors Publishing merged with a company called Standard Statistics, and he is the poor in Standard and Coors. So he's a uh, fame of uh, outlast. And also during the Civil War, actually before the Civil War, around the beginning of the Civil War, he was asked by the United States government. He was a friend of Hannibal Hamlin, who was Lincoln's first vice president. And I think they had been classmates at Bowdoin, I'm not sure. They had some kind of a connection. Anyway, Hannibal Hamlin asked him, or because of Hannibal Hamlin's connections, asked him to do an economic study of the resources of the North versus the South. And he proved conclusively that the North should win the war. He didn't think it would take nearly as long as it did. <coughs> had the North had better generals early in the war, it might not have taken that long. But the North had far greater resources. And I think he published like, like 1,400 page documents on that. And he, he did a lot of studies for the government. And at the uh, late driving of the Golden Spike in Commentary Summit, Utah, in 1869, when the Union Pacific and Central Pacific Railroad to join together, he was there. And his brother was almost was probably more influential in certain ways. John Alfred Poor was, was several years older. He was also born and grew up in Andover. And he, he also became a railroad attorney. And in the 1840s, he became a railroad promoter. He moved to Portland. They both had been Bangor. He moved to Portland and started promoting a railroad from Portland to Montreal. And in the 1840s, mid 1840s, there was going to be a some kind of a hearing, a committee hearing in Montreal. There were three organizations vying for to, to be the railroad in Montreal from the United States. Uh, one from Portland, one through Vermont, and one from Boston. And the people from Boston were generally considered to have the A's because they had a lot of money behind them. During a blizzard, in the mid-1840s, John Alfred Cooper went by sleigh from Portland up to Andover, up over East Bee Hill, up over Dixville Notch, into Montreal. Took him five days. He had people helping him get new horses and so forth. And when he got there, he got there on the, like on the morning of the day the presentation was to be made. He made a very impassioned presentation with people from Montreal, and they chose to go his route. They, they uh, decided against Boston and Vermont. And that was called the Atlantic and St. Lawrence Railroad. 
and then it became the Grand Trunk. And he was, he, it was him, he was the brainchild, he was the brains behind that. He also promoted the railroad later from eastern Maine into New Brunswick. So he promoted, this was the first international railroad. No railroad anywhere before that time had gone from one country to another. Not even in Europe, nowhere. They, they all stopped at the border. So he was, he promoted the first international railway. And uh, a couple other ones. And uh, he never, as near as I can determine, he never really made much money off them. He was more interested in promoting them. And apparently he might have even had an abrasive personality because eventually he, he'd get in a disagreement with the board of directors of his, or his partners and wind up on the outside. But he, he was the guy that had the ideas and the promoter. And this is a picture from one of the stock certificates. And that's probably like an 1850s train. Now, the train, the railroad came through Bethel, I think, in 1851. Is that right? Right, that's right. And it came to the Bryant's Pond by 1850. And I think it was completed in Montreal by 1853 or right. thereabouts. Yeah. And uh, I, have some, I have a book written about him by his daughter, a woman named Laura. She wrote a book, a very long book about him, and all the things he did. He was just a, a guy that just was a fantastic promoter, but apparently couldn't figure out how to make a buck out of it. And he died uh, because of the strain he put on himself going from Portland to Montreal during that blizzard. He was never the same after that physically, and he died a fairly young, a fairly young man. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, that, this is my last slide, I think. Okay. Uh, anybody have any questions? Anything I can help you with here? <coughs> yes. Uh, I think I was mentioning of uh, Andover, Massachusetts, early in the park, and we got Andover, Maine. How about Andover, New Hampshire? Does that have any? I'm not, area, I'm not sure if there's any bearing there or not. Uh, it's kind of similar to Bethel in many ways. Because Proctor Academy is as yeah. opposed to the uh, Academy. I, I, I have not, if there's a connection, I have not seen it. I, I just don't know. I know that the people who settled Andover, Maine, most of them came from Andover, Massachusetts. Uh, Ezekiel Merrill did not. But most of the other ones did. Not quite all of them did. Most of them came from Andover, and that's why it was named East Andover, Massachusetts. Uh, what the next one with it? New Hampshire? I don't know. It might have been one of them. I'm not sure what it is. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions? Bob, what's the surviving building uh, at the end of the fairgrounds? Is it, is it a building tied in with the fairgrounds? Or oh, yeah. Like yeah. It, it was, might have been one of, the, one of those dining halls I showed you. The one that you can still see? Yeah. They, they eventually turned those into exhibition halls. Uh, when I was a kid, when, the, when they had fair in the the fairs in the late 1940s before they, they went out of business, those were the exhibition halls where they exhibited pies and pumpkins and whatever else you exhibited fairs. And that, that's one of, the, one of the exhibition halls, which I think was well, the dining hall I showed you there. Question here? Yeah. Um, the, ho the house set back from the, across from where Betsy Fisher lived? Yes. They call that the poor farm, but was that the poor farm for poor people? No, 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 no. That was owned by Sam Poor, who was Betsy's father. Betsy Fisher's made the name of Betsy Poor. Yeah. And Sam Poor owned that for many, many years. And and uh, that's you, why they that's why they call it the Poor Farm. Because you referred to the Ellis house as the poor farm earlier. The homestead. Did I, did I say that? Yeah. The uh, that actually that was that was also owned by the poor family. P O O R, not poor as in destitute, yeah. but poor as in that's surname poor. <clears throat> I'm not sure what the connection is. I presume I'm going to guess that Sam Poor was a descendant of one of those people. Uh, and if you guys know Junior Poor, he's also descended from the very early Poors. And so it was not a poor farm for poor people. Nobody in Andover is poor. I mean, they're all <laughs> real estate speculating. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have any other questions? Did Andover have a poor farm? As some not to the best of my knowledge. No. But I have, in, in the, you're probably all aware of this, but if you're not, let me tell you how it works. In the old days, they didn't have the social safety nets we have now. So what would happen is if somebody was actually poor, destitute, pauper, whatever, the town would bid them out. They would put them up for bid, and the person that bid the lowest to provide them with room and board and bare necessities of life would get to keep them. And I have, I could have put it in here, probably should have, 
at least one and maybe two, I know I have one, old document from the late 1800s where somebody was bid out for like three or four dollars a month or something like that. Somebody was going to provide their room and board for three or four dollars a month. As a matter of fact, Natalik, the, the Indian uh, who died in the in Stewartstown, in his last days he was destitute and a, a family in Stewartstown uh, bid him, the, the town paid them to look after him. So they didn't have a farm or such, so, so just individuals who looked after him. Not unlike foster parents or something like that today, except these were for people who were destitute. Uh, any other questions? Sally, you have a question. I have a question. You, you have the answer? You have the answer? <laughs> <laughs> any answer? Any answer? I think people used to go Sure. Yeah. But in the yeah, in, in our day they did. But in the old days, yeah. they didn't have enough. They didn't really have enough money, and they nowadays they offer assistance because they they can kind of fend for themselves in many cases. But in those days, they would just live with the family as a as a border sort of. And that was common throughout throughout this area, probably about. Anybody else have any questions? Okay, I'd like to thank all of you for coming, and uh, thank you. Bob. And uh, punch and goodies are available over here, so help yourself. No, that I did not.